Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about our logo uh, and how we uh, uh, how we rebuilt it or how I rebuilt it in Illustrator. And uh, it, it has an, enough little steps that we thought we'd kind of walk through it. I thought I'd walk through it. We'll see if people have questions about that. Uh, if you are watching, so if you are watching here and you can, if you want to ask questions, you can, of course, go to Makana um, and ask those questions, both those questions up. You can tag them as first hour, second hour. If you're not in Makana, you can actually go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. There's a little QR code there. And what that's going to let you do is actually uh, put your questions in. They'll go into a system that we can bring into our Q&A system. Of course, you can, go to off, ask, you can go to officehours.global and sign up and you'll get a link to how to get into Makana. But if you're not there, you can use askofficehours.global. Now, one of the things that we're doing that's a little bit different today is that we're actually broadcasting to a couple other channels. So if you're in one of those other channels, hi, how's it going? Haven't seen you for a while. Um, so we've been doing uh, the Pixelcore channel as well as the Alex Lindsay channel. Uh, we haven't broadcasted the Pixelcore channel for a long time. Uh, haven't broadcasted the Alex Lindsay channel for a while because we moved it over to officehours.global or Office Hours Global. But if you want to subscribe so that you can do this, if you're if, if this is new for you and you haven't seen this before, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash Office Hours Global and uh, subscribe there. Um, so you can, if you're watching this on the Pixelcore channel or on the Alex Lindsay channel, you can subscribe here. We do this six days a week. <laughs> so six days a week uh, to YouTube, seven days a week total. And we've been doing that since uh, March 25th, 2020. So, uh, so we'd love to have you uh, join um, us over here. We will not be broadcasting every day to these channels. So if you're not on, if you're on Pixelcore or on uh, on the Alex Lindsay channel, occasionally <laughs> we're going to turn it on and let you see what's going on. Um, so so we'll. This is the first time we're trying it, um, and we'll see what see if you enjoy it. Um, but we're going to broadcast to them every once in a while. You'll see them going across the different channels, and we're going to include other channels as we go down the path. But anyway, so that's um, that's where you can go. YouTube.com slash Office Hours Global. And let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? Welcome, new viewers. Our first question coming up is from Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Will you pay 20 bucks for Copilot Pro for Microsoft, which just passed Apple as the most valuable company at $2.887 trillion, with a T, versus Apple at $2.874 trillion? I go ahead, John. I, I'm happily paying OpenAI $20. You get more value from OpenAI. You've got access to all the plugins now you've got access to the gpts which can be useful in fact if you listen to leo he took all of his programming books and put them up uh, as gpts which is is pretty smart uh thing to do and so you know microsoft's goal is to put it everywhere not to charge for it uh so integrated in the uh, in uh, operating system integrated in all the apps so you now, just find it everywhere when you say uh leo put up the his programming books as chat gbt's what do you what do you mean by that so he took he took um oh not P php he's got he's got a couple of books that he took in pdf and, and with the gpt's you're able to build your own gpt so you're 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 able to upload your own corpus into the mm -hmm. gpt's and stuff that's not already indexed in the web. So if you got right. specific information that's not indexed on the web, you can build your own GPTs. Interesting. Now go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and also it will, if you build your own, it'll uh, limit it to just that corpus uh, as opposed to bringing, hallucinating and bringing in stuff that it, it doesn't, you don't know where it came from. Uh, I've been using Copilot without paying for it. It's free. It's in, uh, it's in the Bing browser. It's in the upper right-hand corner here. What it looks like from our website here, it's a little icon that now is in the upper right corner, opens it up. And I found it'll generate images. You can post, you can upload images into it and say, what is this? It uh, can, it has voice input uh, right here so that you can ask it anything. And I found it to be much more accurate than GPT 3.5. I've asked it questions about myself that it gets wrong. And I ask it in Copilot and it's right every time. So it, uh, Copilot, I think, does a better job of uh, checking the accuracy of its answers, especially if you you keep it on the more precise response. It also generates has Dolly two or Dolly three built in for image generation. So you just in the bot there, you just type create a picture of and describe it, and it will create it. It's not near as detailed as Midjourney. 
Mid Journey still is far, far and ahead away from that, but it'll generate a 1024 by 1024 uh, four images for you, and then you can add to that and tell it to change that, you know, remove the glasses, remove the background, change the background to this or whatever. And uh, and it does all that. Uh, and they like uh, John says, they are incorporating that into all the Office 365, or we're now called Windows 365 apps, which used to be called Office. But pretty much every programming app is going to have a copilot panel you can open and ask it to generate code or generate pictures or generate stuff there are limitations to the free point you can paste uh, documents in there and have it summarized right now i think they're limited to twenty thousand words in a document so you're limited in the amount of stuff that you can kind of paste into it and have it analyzed in one one gulp uh but uh and there are limitations on the resolution of the pictures that it that it generates right now for the free version but it is currently free it's interesting. Yeah. It, it, who, who would have thought that when, when Microsoft lost its antitrust, that it would become the, that 20 years later, or t- over 20 years later, it would be the largest company in the world. <laughs> it just, it, it shows you the, the, the sheer. Uh, of, and they you know, did it without sizing. selling any hardware too. You it's know. crazy. It's crazy. Uh, uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, Blue Cat Audio has introduced Fader Hub, which is a software-based mixer with integrated network audio transport. Could this be a sound desk replacement? Uh, it could be. Uh, we just saw it today. I mean, I haven't seen it past what what uh, Douglas posted there. Uh, it it looks interesting. It has um, it, it's Windows and Mac, so it's not Sound Desk is only on the Mac. There, uh, we would have to test it for stability and feature sets, and whether it ties into our MIDI controllers the same way. But it definitely could be um, a, uh, a a useful tool. So we'll do some more research in that area because I think that it it does look pretty interesting. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it's it's strange. I look at these things. Uh, I was looking at that uh, particular product on the uh, link that was supplied by Douglas, and they make plugins now look more and more like the hardware that you could buy. And it's confusing to me because I'll see something and say, "Oh, that's really cool," but why does it have an Ethernet cable? You know, sticking out of it like that. Saying that because they have network audio, they you put the network on. It's it's like and there's a network. So that I think. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. So I, I don't think it actually has an Ethernet that comes out of your screen. I think it's just a, you know it's a graphic. Uh, it's a very odd graphic. I will admit. Uh, next question. Craig Kadoki from Toronto, Canada. I've got an OmniGraphle file of a system layout that I'd like to send to the client as a PDF. I believe that the PDF format can do layers. How do I create a layered PDF so that it's easier for the client to follow the diagram more easier? Yeah. So the I believe the layer option in PDF is very new, as in last October they announced it. So it's a very new thing. As a result, I'd be very careful of implementing something into PDF because you don't know if all the readers will know what to do with the layers. Um, so, so I'd be careful of, of doing layered outputs. You, I think that from my understanding is what you can do in, is bring it into – you'd have to bring it into Acrobat right now. It's br- brand, brand new. I don't think – that support for layers is in, on any third-party app. So what you would ha- need to do is bring in ping files and really have each layer exported as a ping file with transparency, then bring those into uh, into your Acrobat um, directly and then load those in and define them as layers. So that's what you need to, to actually do to produce those layers there. The other way to do it is just to produce a page for every layer or layer it up so you have the different layers and as you go through the pages, you're either taking them down or, or putting them in. Um, it's not quite as nice as having true layers because you can't randomly access those, um, but it is a way that you could probably um, make that work. But I'd be very careful about using layers right now because I, my understanding, at least, is that it's a very new thing um, to uh, to PDFs. Uh, next question. Jason Rubbershaw from Sarasota, Florida, has a question. Zoom records to a computer. Is there a way to remove the host name from the lower left when recording? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, there's no switch that I know of other than to use like Zoom ISO or Mimo Live or uh, OBS, which will uh, separate that video out so that you can put your own lower third. But uh, I don't believe there's any way to turn that on and off from a regular Zoom. Yeah, assuming that you're talking about the yeah the different the name your name down down in the lower uh, lower corner here. The only thing you can really do is um, use an like an invisible like a lot of us you have used periods in the past. So it's just one little dot uh, down there. So you just put a little period. Uh, I think that Zoom actually doesn't let you just use. There's a bunch of invisible characters, and I don't think that they allow you to use any of those invisible characters. And so you're kind of stuck with a dot. 
Um, I will say that as a visual effects person, a dot is really easy to remove later. So if you if you do create a dot there, um, there's a ton of tools that will do that relatively easily as far as getting rid of it if that's what you really want. But the real way to do this is with something like Zoom ISO. Um, so if you can if you can use Zoom ISO there, uh, you're going to be able to record something that is completely clean uh, without any debris at all and without any chance of debris uh, later. So uh, I would highly recommend uh, looking at Zoom ISO as as the solution for that. But if you can't do that, I would make your everybody just have their names as periods and you will not have very much to clean up later. Uh, next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. What USB PTZ point a uh, pan tilt zoom camera has the best image quality must have usb uvc for zoom far end control uh good mitchell yeah it uh, makes it a short list when you add it uh, usb to it because uh our our lovable fr7 from sony doesn't have usb on so i guess that takes us back yeah. to either a bird dog or a uh, no, bird uh ptz I optics I don't know if bird dogs will do it but yeah the um uh the i do believe that you can get remote control uh of that with both the OBSBOT, um, the new OBSBOT, as well as the uh, Insta360 Link also has remote control over them. Uh, I think that both of those, the, the, the newer OBSBOT, which I have, as well as the Insta360, I think that the visual quality is very close to each other. So I don't, I think that they are the best um, image quality for a PTZ right now that's USB based. Um, the, uh, and that is also controllable by Zoom. The one caveat is that I I find that the OBSBOT software, at least on the Mac, is not nearly as full-featured or as stable as the Insta360 software. The advantage of the OBSBOT is that it potentially is controllable by OSC or other external controls, which we don't have for um, the Insta360 link. So, um, so if you want to try to build some extra tools to it, you may want to think about the OBSBOT. If you want to use it as it is, and potentially have use the tools that are that are built for it, as well as the UVC control. I look at the Insta three hundred and sixty link. Um, it's about three hundred bucks, and it's a it's a great great camera. I've got four of them. Uh, next question. Chester Sweeney with a QR code question. He's from Las Vegas, Nevada. EcoFlow versus Jackery. Does one clearly dominate in performance? I don't think so. I think they're both very similar in in uh, feature set. So if, if they they're they're close. I think that the EcoFlows look nicer than the Jackeries, but the Jackery has a handle, and and I and I and I uh, so I <laughs> I like the handle. So so uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think either one of them is dominating the other one. Um, next question, and it's from Douglas Carmichael. I've been looking at the Yamaha DM3D as a small mixer for my system, but it still seems to be difficult to find. What audio interfaces would have a similar I/O count, but also an internal mixing engine? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that Yamaha, it's it's surprising how much trouble they're actually oops, uh, having with, uh, um, I'm trying to find it here. I just want to make sure I got, I'm, I'm talking about the right one here. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, they're having a lot of trouble. These are the new, this is the new uh, Yamaha. And as far as an interface goes, uh, you know, I think that, I mean, this one looks like a lot of people seem to really like it. It's just that it's almost impossible to actually get. Um, the... You know, as far as I/O goes, I mean, I still think you're kind of stuck in the X32 world if if you're not going to get the uh, DM3D. So I think that that's the that's the thing to kind of consider there. Uh, still, a lot of us would probably the the X32 rack will still have more I/O actually than the Yamaha DM3D. But a lot of folks like the interface to it, and it's a Yamaha box, and um, there's a lot of advantages to it from a from a uh, kind of a usability perspective. Uh, so, so, but it's impossible to get right now. So I think that we'll, we'll keep tracking it. Um, but I think that I would probably look at the X32 if, if, the, if you can't get a DM3D in the same price point, same interface, same IO. I don't think there's a lot of options there. Um, next question. Jacob, good night from Indianapolis, Indiana. How often do you restart your computers and ISP modems and what are best practices? Go ahead, Courtney. I usually don't restart them unless I'm having difficulty. I let everything run all the time. I have a lot of stuff set to auto update, so it will auto update, uh, which is dangerous. I understand, but um, uh, usually the computer, if I'm running into problems, then I will reboot everything, and I almost never re reboot my cable modem or uh, ISP modem uh, unless I'm having difficulty. Uh, communicating with something, and then I will restart it or check for updates. Then at that point, see if see how far behind I am in updates and update it. 
Uh, it does make difference. Some of these computers on the Windows side have been having trouble with the USB bus overflows, and there's a memory leak somewhere in there in some of the USB drivers, which is an issue I've been having and dealing with Dell they haven't fixed. Uh, so, you know, when you reboot it, it refreshes all those, uh, uh, resets all those buffers back to zero again, and, and uh, the leak can start again. So it, it's useful for that. Good, Mitchell. I do what uh, uh, Alex was talking about the other day is when you have an important meeting or project that's getting started, reboot everything. Um, and that's a good move. Obviously, you wouldn't reboot on show. But uh, the only reason that I reboot my ISP modem is that occasionally they push an update out. And a lot of times that update includes a speed increase. So uh, that's a good thing to check at least once a month. Yeah, I, I, I will admit if I'm doing a show, I've, I've been doing um, the show with Michael Krasny every uh, Friday with Memo Live. and. I restart it, and I find that Memo runs a little bit smoother when everything's when it's all brand new again. Um, I'm I uh, have been because that machine is is running Memo. I've been a little careful about not upgrading all the way to uh, Sonoma. I did I, I did I know this will sound crazy. I've actually updated I think all of my computers um, except for my Telestrator computer and my studio. I've updated everything to. Sonoma and everything seems to be working okay. It, it's <laughs> you know, not February, area. Alex. It's close. It's close. But I, I'm not, my main computer is still waiting for February. But uh, but anyway, but we're um, kind of just kind of gradually looking at it and seeing how things go. I'm, I'm trying to get used to the interface stuff with the other computers rather than the main one. So, uh, so we'll, we'll keep on moving down. But I, again, like Mitchell, when I have something important to do, I tend to restart things just to make sure that everything's kind of clean and there's nothing that's going to surprise me. Next question. It's another QR code question coming from Kane Trouble in Mildura, Australia. I realized looking around my setup, I've been the next gen version of my grandfather with a ham radio. What do you think our kids will end up doing? Go ahead, John. I think I think it's going to be spatial computing. So the kids will have white to have lightweight glasses on for all their displays, for gaming, for texting, for doing everything that they do. I have 12 monitors in my room here, which is silly. It's like the days of CRT monitors where we had giant 20-inch or 19-inch monitors on our desk. I had three SGI monitors on my desk, and I couldn't see anybody in front of me. It was hilarious. And the other thing I wish I could do is short, like the Meekum Auto Show. I think muscle cars are doomed for failure. Kids don't care about cars anymore. They, I, I will definitely agree with you that the, the car, the car thing has you know there's just there's just zero pressure um, you know that uh, to get. You know, I was talking to um, one of my kids' friends and asking about that, and they were like, "Well, if you get a, if you get your license, then you have to, um, then you're the one that has to drive. <laughs> like, you know, and you can't use your phone." And so the idea, there's a little bit of a, no one wants to be the driver, um, you know, in that situation. Go ahead, Mitchell. How do you call a CQ field day with a pair of uh, Vision Pro glasses on? That's yeah, exactly. what I want to know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it's um, it's interesting. I'm trying to get this picture of my grandfather. There's a picture of my grandfather floating around somewhere in the in i think 1926 and he's in his dorm room and his you know where he went to school and he's got wires all hanging out um because he had built because he was building these crystal radio sets and doing these you know all the things and uh and i just realized that, that yeah didn't go very far <laughs> and i grew up with him having a he had an 1100 watt uh transmitter in the in the living room and an 80 foot antenna in the backyard um, and, uh, when he jumped on and said, CQ, 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 uh, it definitely got everybody's attention. You know, there was enough power and enough antenna to get, to go a long way. And I grew up with that and I grew up uh, learning how to solder with him and everything else. And so it is trying to figure out what, you know, my son now is building, you know, he built his PC, he builds, he builds stuff all the time. We're, you know, doing some uh, Arduino stuff together. And, uh, but I think that those are the kind of things that we're, that we have there. I think that the other side of that though, I will say, is that we should still learn analog tools. You know, we should, I think that it's good to keep in the back of our head that all these technology is fragile and could be taken away from us at any moment. <laughs> you know, it would not be very hard to take away all of it. And so we just have to make sure we actually know how to build a fire and how to do the other things without, without, without electro electronics. Now go ahead, Courtney. In my day... Well, exactly. the, uh, the back in the early, you know, the, the social media of the 1900s uh, was the party line after Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. And then the, then it moved to ham radio. And that became the social media of the day. 
And then, of course, it transitioned into texting for the kids. Uh, everybody used the J9. Remember the old, using the, the numeric keypad where you would text on the old AT&T phones. Kids got into SMS messaging uh, and became really addicted to that. And a lot of people were surprised with their, got their phone bills in when they were charging 10 cents for every text that you sent. Uh, and you, <laughs> the kids, you, the parents would get the phone bill and go, Eight hundred and fifty dollars this month. And it was such a, it was such a, uh, a, 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 you know, raw deal too. Because in the rest of the world, texts were free or very, very little, and it was much less expensive. The reason text took off is that it was much less expensive to text people than call. So if you right. called, you were going to pay a lot per minute, and th so they'd be constantly. If you were in, when I was in Africa, that people were just constantly texting with each other, and I had to figure out what texting was. You know, like what are they doing over there? And and um, and they. Uh, so, but here they just figured, well, it's just free money, you know, it, it, so, so they, it, they charging us 15 cents or 10 cents on SMS. It was, it was literally hard. free money because it was just, it cost them nothing to move that around and they charged us lots they of money made for it. Lots of, just, it's like uh, paying so extra for a color telephone, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, if you don't want black, it's going to cost you $10, you know, $6 a month for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, but and nowadays... The, I was just going to say that uh, Preto's idea of having uh, uh, virtual glasses, uh, virtual uh, uh, social media rooms on AR glasses is going to turn all the kids into little zombies walking into walls and things. In the <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I, I, um, uh, I, I, I just, I just finally, I know that the the metas or the that the uh, the the uh, Apple Vision's coming out, or it goes on sale on Friday. And uh, I'll order one of those because I, you know, I want to build content for it and I want to see whether it works and I'm on a show that talks about it. So I feel like it, it's, it's good. I got enough excuses to buy it. Um, but I also am getting, a, I, I, I was talking to someone about it. I'm getting a Meta 2, which is now down to $250. Um, and the reason for that is that someone was talking about Supernatural as this, the best workout that they've had virtually, you know, like they just say it's a lot more fun than working out and they're, they get, you know, it's a really good workout. So I'm going to give it a shot and see what it looks like and be able to, I also want to be able to compare it from, for the show, for, for, um, Mac break, compare it to what, whatever comes out as fitness for the Apple. The, the only thing I have about it is spending $3,500. I'm not sure how much I want to exercise in it because I don't want to get it sweaty. You know, like, like I was just like, if I, I don't want to actually exercise the, the, at $250, that's like my workout headset <laughs> at $3,500. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. So, you know, so what is, so, super, what is supernatural? Is it a, a VR game where you're running from brain eating zombies or something? No, it's, it, well, it's, a, it's exercise. designed as workouts and you, and you block things or you do things or whatever. And they said it's a, I mean, uh, some folks that I've talked to said it's a great workout. And, um, and they said, but you're, it, it's giving you something environmentally to do in this, in the VR space that, and I, I have to admit, I got a pretty good exercise out of, uh, I got a pretty good workout out of playing Robo Recall when I, you know, like if you did that for half an hour, you're pretty tired. Um, and so uh, if you did it, you know, without using the guns, which is what I did. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, uh, so the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, so I think that it's going to be really interesting to um, uh, see what, see what that looks like. But yeah, I do think that the people will get into that, but I do think that there's also, usually what happens is there's a rep, rep, rubber band, where things go out and people get really techy, and then there's a, a drive for something more analog. And so it'll be really interesting to see what that rubber band actually looks like. If you've got questions, of course, you can throw them into the into uh, Mukana and you can um, ask those questions. You can vote on those questions. If you're not in Mukana, uh, you can, of course, use the uh, this little QR code here and go to askofficehours.global. Uh, That's askofficehours.global. Um, or, or just use this QR code here. And if this is new to you, this is the first day we've tried this, so let us know if you like it or not. Um, but if this is new to you, you can go to the youtube.com slash officehoursglobal. Subscribe there. We do this six days a week. Do it seven days a week, but we do it six days to YouTube. Um, and uh, we do it every morning. Uh, we've been doing it for three, almost four years <laughs> straight. Uh, so uh, if this is new to you, go ahead and subscribe there. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you as part of the community. Next question. And it's from Talalik Lopez Waterman in Pittsburgh, PA. This week, I have been using a Mac Pro Intel Cheese Grater Edition for projection design with Isadora at the Pittsburgh Opera. And it's been a lovely experience so far. Has anyone tried the M-Series Mac Pros? Any performance reports? 
I don't know if anyone on the panel has the the um, the the Mac Pros. I think that the, for me, what happened as I bought the studio. Uh, and thinking I didn't, I didn't get the the most powerful studio, admittedly because I thought I'd buy the Mac Pro. Um, but by the time the Mac Pro came out, there was this rumor of this headset, so I started saving for that instead. Um, and I felt like my studio was as fast as I as I as I as I needed it to be. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. So now look, I'm using the original cheese grater. I have a 2010 uh, Mac Pro that still works fine with Premiere, but it's stuck. At Mojave, so that's the maybe maybe it would run Isidore just fine for you, but uh, I'm saving up for the uh, for the new one. I go, John. I don't think there's enough differentiation between the high end studio and and the Mac Pro right now. But Mac Pros make great coffee tables. I have two of them right here with a piece of glass on top. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'd be more interested to know what you're doing, what software you're using for projection mapping. Yeah, let us know, Tlaloc. Um, uh, next question. QR code question from Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada. Is there a good way to send audio from an M1 Mac Mini and an M2 Mac Mini into a Behringer Flow 8? Do I need to squeeze my Mix Pre 3 in there somewhere? Not for live, but for mixing sounds and songs. Yeah, I don't I don't think that there... I guess I would d- say, where is that flow going? So where is your Flow 8 going to... What is it? What is that connected to? Um, so is that connected to a, a third computer or is it one of the computers that's there? So passing, if you're passing it from, from the M1 to the M2 or you're passing it to other computers, you may want to think about getting some kind of Dante device and being able to use Dante to get them back and forth. That's what I do here um, is I use Dante to get back and forth between my computers and it works pretty well. Um, I probably wouldn't want to go out to analog and then back to digital unless I was forced to. Um, so, so I think that that's the only thing that I would say is to look at whether you need to do that. If you do, what you're looking for is some kind of USB. And I think that radial, I think we talked about it in the past, radial has a great um, USB to XLR output, which you could do and then go out to that. Um, and that'd probably be less expensive than using the, than, well, if you already have the Mix Pre 3, it won't be less expensive, but it'd be less expensive than dedicating a Mix Pre 3 to it. Um, and so you may want to look at those those tools as a way to get out into analog and then going back into the mixer. But as, as I said, I would try to find a direct route between the the um, the computers. If you have another computer that's getting that flow eight, I'd probably bring it in that way. Next question. Next question from Xander Snell in Miami, Florida. Hello, all. I'm looking to improve a live presentation of software use in an iMag situation. Currently, I use an AJA ROI scaling feature and mouse pose to highlight the cursor. Any other tools I should be considering? You know, it really depends on on the. I know we always say this, but it depends. <laughs> it depends on what you're trying to do. That's a pretty efficient way uh, to show it right now. I guess if you're showing live presentation uh, software, I mean, the only thing that I would, you know, it, it depends on what are they showing and how are they showing it, um, and what are they do they want to interact with it. So, for instance, one of the things that that I really like to do is be able to draw over things. So I have a Telestrator that I can kind of draw on top of the screen while I'm showing things and while I'm talking about those things. And you'll see that a little bit in the second hour. Um, so um, those are the, you know, and to do that, what I'm really doing now is is I'm, is I'm going into a switcher. Um, so by sending this into the switcher and being able to set layers and so on and so forth and being able to cut back and forth, you know, I find that to be relatively effective. I just don't know what you have in between. Is this, R- is this, um, the AJA ROI um, is uh, is the region of interest. So you're able to zoom into certain areas and zoom out of those areas. And it's a really great little box um, that, that does a lot of different things. Um, so, but but that's what you're, um, uh, uh, but you, I guess the question is, what are you trying to show and what else would you like to do with it would be the big question there. Um, but there's, you know, it's interesting. There's not a lot of great ways to do scale and scale in zoom ins. Um, but what you can do is if you have a 4K switcher, note that you could do a 4K output from a computer and then you can do all kinds of moves and using something like an ATEM switcher with Mix Effect Pro and um, kind of scales up and moving your DVE around, you may be able to find something pre-programmed. I'm not sure if it'll be that much better, but it'd be, that'd be something else to look at. Um, next question. John Fisher from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Can you disable the status LED light on the Insta360 link? Don't see any controls for it on the camera software. Yeah, I did some research on this, and I and I found that a small strip of gaff tape turns it right off. Like just just 
put a little piece of tech gaff tape over top or electrical tape. I assume it'll work. I use gaff tape. Um, but uh, it turns that light off so quickly. Um, and it really doesn't require any software to turn it back on again. You just simply peel it off. That's what I've done with them because I there's no other way to do it. There's no other. I, I haven't seen any way to turn the light off other than putting a very, very, like, little tiny if you if you if you take your scissors or you take i have a cutting mat on my desk that's all i that's it's always sitting here so i can always cut things that right 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 in front of me and um uh you find that you can you can cut a very very small one with an exacto knife and uh, and then just just plug it right on top of that and then it'll never turn on next question Douglas Carmichael asks, the Yamaha SeekTrack Groovebox includes reactive 3D graphics and its companion app. What would be the most effective choice for creating 3D graphics that respond to MIDI or OSC on the Mac OS? Uh, you know, I think that I think that one of the things, it depends on whether you're trying to do it live or not live. So uh, there's a lot of options if you're not trying to do it live. And there's less options. if you're, There's a lot of DJ software out there that you can use that, that can, you know, simulate a lot of those things and build those out. Um, so there's, and I'm not going to get into all of them right now. There's many, many, um, and there some of them are kind of 3D. The other thing to look at is whether you want to take um, data and run it into something like Unreal Engine, which would work on the Mac, not as well as a PC, but it would work. Um, so you can build the 3D models that you want to respond, and then you have to decide what you're filtering for. So that might be a certain uh, frequency range. So you can have you can set things up where you have frequencies that are that are going in different areas. Another place to think about this is something like Isadora. Isadora um, by Trochatronics could can definitely take um, different sequences there, and Isadora will definitely work on a Mac and a PC. Um, and so it can take you can t basically take different frequencies and have them create new effects. And with Isadora, you'd be able to do a lot of different things um, inside of that, of, of being able to rotate them and scale them and do it. But that that's possible in real time, in Unreal, in Isadora. I mean, those are those are two examples of, of things that would do it relatively in a relatively straightforward way. Um, you can also, uh, if you're doing it in post, uh, you can run uh, files into something like Cinema 4D. And then what you're going to do is build a node structure um, that's going to be, ab that's going to act that's going to, um, uh, yeah, that's going to, that's going to handle that there. So, yeah, so that, that would be the, um, that'd be something that I would, that I would, those are the things I would think about there. Uh, next question. That is from Walt Palmer in snowy Lewis, Delaware. I've got a radio host that connects via Zoom from various remote locations. Please recommend a microphone that can be easily transported and set up on site. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. We really like the Shure MV7. Uh, it's got a USB and a uh, XLR connector on it. Uh, USB can go right into a computer. Uh, of course, the XLR go into an interface like the UV2 or whatever else. Also, uh, if you're in broadcasting, which obviously you are, Walt, uh, the venerable F, uh, SM7B is now the SM7X with a USB out. So either microphone, uh, I would recommend well, for the that SM type or of use. There's the MV7X, which doesn't have USB, and then there's the M SM7DB, which has its own, can bump its own gain. I think those are the two different things that Shure's put out there. The, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the MV7s have been relatively good. My complaint about the MV7 has been that it is, um, uh, that it, uh, the the USB the, is a micro USB and it tends to be sensitive to being used overused and it gets loose and it then becomes a little harder to sit into it. We've tested uh, and we're going to talk about it tomorrow. We have this road here. Um, this is the road and it has it feels more modern. It's a lot heavier. So for us, from a shipping perspective to the quality perspective, I'm not sure this is the right mic for us. Um, I'm not sure we're ready to jump yet um, from from where we are right now. Um, but uh, but I think that this is something we're going to test. We are doing a quote unquote mic off um, tomorrow, so we'll be showing this one. We'll have the MV7. Uh, we'll have a, a series of other mics that I'm going to all put into one mixer, and so you can listen to them one after the other. Um, and we'll compare it to this mic as a kind of a reference point, um, and uh, and kind of go from there. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Harshid was uh, posting something in chat, and you can follow up on this, Harshid, because you're here on the panel today about this uh, SE Electronics. He says a lot of people are proclaiming this to be a good USB mic. Uh, this is a deal with monitor and headphones for about 127 bucks at, I think, B&H. Uh, I haven't heard it. Uh, maybe it'll be, I don't know if it'll be in, I don't think, I don't know if Alex has one for a big shootout tomorrow. So that might be that something one. to look at. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. 
I guess my question is, uh, is it better to have USB versus XLR or both? And it sounds like the, the connector issue could be, uh, could, could be an issue with that. I mean, the big, the big thing is, are you going to, you know, for most of us that have mixers, you don't need the USB, um, you, know, you, don't, you know, like, and so you just XLR is all you need. The reason that we buy mics with USB is so that if we send them to somebody who doesn't have that, they can easily plug them in and not have to deal with uh, some kind of interface. So, and now one of the things that you can do that's halfway in between, I, I literally was playing with it while we were talking and now I set it down somewhere. Oh, here it is. So this is the other option here is, is we, we talk, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. This is the Shure uh, MVX2U. So this is the Shure MVX2U. And what this has is an XLR in and a USB out. Um, and, and I think that this is a, um, a solid way to convert anything to a USB mic. Um, so this is another another option there, and we are kind of researching whether we want to start replacing it. The MV7 has worked pretty darn well. Um, the way that it's set up makes it hard. One of the things about the MV7 that makes it difficult when we send it out, it's hard to put a pop filter on it because of the way that the interface works. Um, so it's it's hard to just attach one to it. Um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge on our end when we send it out. We'd love to put a pop filter on it because, but the there's no good structure for that. Um, like, see, so, the adapter you have, does it have a side tone uh, headphone jack on it? Yeah. Because yeah, that could be very valuable. Yeah, it's, got, it's got a headphone jack on it. Yeah, you have to have, you, one thing you have to have on a mic, if it's got USB, is a, is a headphone jack. But you need to be able to make sure that you can hear yourself with zero latency. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll go crazy. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Hashid. Yeah, well, the capsule that I'm using is basically the same capsule as that's found in the Neo microphone. So um, we had a couple people in After Hours talk about it. And that's where the recommendation came about. So maybe there are some other, you know, opportunities for people that don't have an interface in between. But uh, as you already covered, the Shure is a great choice to go in between uh, if you're trying to bring in an XLR microphone. Uh, and with the MV7 and the MV7X, the MV7X gives a little bit better sound uh, com in comparison because of it's using both USB and XLR. And uh, the other I, thing actually, is the touch the, the MV7, I just want to correct you there, the MV7X does not have X, does not have USB on it. No, it like does that's, Right, right. So that, that, it doesn't. Right, yeah. it makes it, the circuit between, it doesn't share circuits, it sounds better and cleaner uh, from hmm. my ears than V7X. Yeah, I, I haven't heard, if you're using XLR from both of those, I haven't heard a difference, but maybe you, you have, might have better ears <laughs> than mine. So um, uh, next question. QR code question coming in from Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada. Is there anyone in or on officehours.global that zooms in from a houseboat? What would those typical issues or problems be to watch out for? Connectivity. <laughs> I don't know how many I don't know how many houseboats are connected via Ethernet, um, but uh, we'd have to talk to someone about it. I don't think anybody here is connecting to a houseboat. Although I would love to, I would love to be on a houseboat and uh, connect to. I don't know if I'd want to live in a houseboat the whole time, but doing a show from a houseboat would be great, especially if we took it out to sea. Uh, but uh, connectivity is probably going to be the biggest challenge. That and everything moving a little bit all the time. Uh, next question. Zach Stallsmith from Chautauqua, New York. Would a Mac Mini be a good machine to incorporate into a mobile rack that is being used to produce Zoom hybrid meetings? This would be paired with an X32 and a PTZ cam. We do this a lot. So the Mac Minis are great because you can rack mount them in. So, so you, you can rack mount them. You get them all into a set state. Uh, you put monitors wherever you want them. Uh, a lot of times you think you want to use a laptop, and there are some advantages. The laptop's battery-based, so it's got its own quote-unquote UPS um, that, that's there. Uh, it's got its own screen, but a lot of times that becomes cumbersome when you're trying to build a rack that you're going to support a system with. One of the things we really like are the SKB racks that, that kind of pull out of their own case. Um, and uh, so th we, we like to build things into those. Uh, one thing to think about as you start to build those racks, if you're going to ship them, is... Um, think about how, what gear is sitting underneath other gear and whether there's a large hangover. When they get thrown, which is what happens when you ma mail them, um, they, it builds a cantilever lever um, that will bend things <laughs> if you're not careful. So, so think about those as you start to build those out. Um, but from a, from, should you use a Mac Mini? We use them all the time. Uh, we have, that's why we have so many Mac Minis at O9O is because we build kits with them. Um, they're great. And uh, they work really well. And you can do a lot of, you know, because they're M1s, you can do things like talk to your Blackmagic camera, talk to your Mix Pre 3, talk to other things like that really effectively. So uh, highly recommended. Next question. 
Fred Parr from Kent, Washington. Business question, what are some good ideas for getting clients for a one-person company providing corporate video? Um, network. <laughs> so uh, you, you need to find, uh, you know, the, the big thing is you need to find places that people are going to be and then you need to be there. Uh, the thing that that I've always done is try to help the industry that I'm in. So that meant volunteering, that meant speaking, that meant doing other things that would get me involved in the communities that are um, that are connected to that. And so I think that that's the, um, you know, think about the, the things that are actually more useful than they seem are things like rotary as well. Like you can, co- you can contact your local rotary and say, I'm willing to, I'm, you know, I'm, I can talk about doing production, video production of the thing. And what you want to do is not like, I want to talk about my company. That's not going to get you very far. What you want to do is say, I can do a breakfast for you that, or, you know, I can do a, a thing for Rotary that is explaining how this works, explaining, you know, what you need to understand and really make it very informational. The closer you get to trying to sell yourself, the harder it is to sell yourself. The, the most useful thing you can do is, is to figure out how you serve the market that you want to be part of. Um, so I would recommend that, um, you know, it's it's one of the reasons that we have volunteer positions here is so people can meet each other all over the world and get to work with each other and get to know the processes and the and how we kind of approach things. And so so those are things that um, uh, that I would that I would really consider, but get involved, whether it's here in office hours or in other places, get involved with your communities that you want to be part of. And you'll you'll suddenly find a lot of other people that are that you can potentially work with. Um, next question. Danny Grizzle from Longview, Texas, has a question. I've been following the discussion of kits for remote guests on live streams. What does the panel think of Apogee's Hype Mic, which seems ideal in size, plus contains a built-in analog compressor? I go ahead, Mitchell. I think it's always dangerous to have some type of uh, intermediate interface between the mic and your computer uh, when you're sending it out somewhere, because the more buttons there are, the more chances that the person uh, may mess with it. I have not had a chance to uh, 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 to try out the Apogee device, but most Apogee devices are excellent. Dig that thumbs up for me. Yeah, I haven't gotten I haven't gotten to use this mic. Um, it is a I think it's it's expensive enough that it I've, it's been outside of what I'm willing to experiment with. <laughs> so so uh, you know so I I, I haven't uh, haven't downloaded. Although I could get it today between five and ten p.m. if I ordered it right now, which I'm not going to do. Uh, maybe we'll see if we can. Come test on, it you know tomorrow. you want it. We're going to test it for tomorrow and then we'll see if we keep it or not. Um, yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. Algorithm is bringing DJ, their DJing app, to the Vision Pro. Could you see Vision OS becoming a performance and production platform in the future? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's going to, I mean, the, there's going to be a lot that the people are doing inside of the Vision, uh, inside of the Vision Pro. Uh, you know, I, I, what's, what I found interesting is I was talking to a creator that, and I talked about this, I think, here and on MacBreak that actually is already cutting shows um, with three monitors on their MetaQuest. So their MetaQuest 3, they're, they've got, they're doing these shows together. And, and I think that it is a, uh, um, it's really interesting how people are kind of extending that. Um, I think a lot of folks, again, one of the reasons I'm buying the Vision Pro is that I'm a content creator and I've worked in uh, spatial of some version for the last 25 years. And so I feel like I can bring a lot of experience to it and potentially do a lot of work in that area. And so I want to get one and start thinking about it. What you're going to see is there's going to be this little lag where there's a lot of kind of uh, goofy things uh, and there's people experimenting. But over time, it's going to start kind of um, coming together and people are going to start producing a lot of products out of it. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I don't know about a performance uh, platform, you know, because DJs, I don't know if they're going to want to look goofy with the headsets on uh, in front of people because, you know, they can become a bit performative. So, and it's a pretty much, you know, the vision pro is a, a personal thing. You know, only one person really is looking at the output of that vision pro. Maybe you can output of it, uh, output the video from it to a screen or something. So people might be able to see what you're seeing, but it's uh, a fairly personal thing. You know, it's, it's just for you. So performing work, I can see that, you know, production uh, platform, if you're just an editor or something, arranging your workspace. But for performance in public, I don't see where it's going to fit in. Uh, we'll see. 
A <laughs> uh, quick, uh, quick re reminder that, of course, uh, you can, if you have questions, you can go ahead and throw those questions in. And if you're in Makana, you can vote on those questions. That's always really important. Um, and I'm going to try to find my uh, find my switcher here as I started to talk here. I, um, and uh, if you, uh, you can, of course, use the QR code here. Um, so this is askofficehours.global. You can throw questions in for the first hour, uh, even the second hour, as we get into the second hour. Uh, you can throw those in there using that QR code or just going to askofficehours.global. If this is new to you and you're on a, on the YouTube channel, of course, you can go to youtube.com slash officehoursglobal. Um, that is the subscribe there. Uh, you'll then, you know, we're not going to do this every single day um, on all these channels. We're just doing it today. Um, and we'll do it a couple times a week, maybe. Um, uh, but if you want all of the, the streams that we're doing, uh, then you want to go to um, youtube.com slash office hours uh, global and subscribe. Uh, one quick note about yesterday, uh, Mickey pointed out to me. So I, I had, by, by the way, I had said something relatively rough about mag liners <laughs> because I, I, of, a, of, a, of a wheel folding under. I'd like to correct myself. That was a rock and roller. Um, it was not a mag liner. I, I actually, I don't have any mag liners because they've never had a form factor that really worked for me. Um, so, so I haven't, I've, I've actually never used a mag liner. Uh, it's the rock and roller that I was compounding with the mag liner. Um, and uh, when I looked at it quickly, I just didn't get, get it quite right. But the rock and rollers, I would never buy again. Uh, the mag liners, I don't have any opinion about because by the time we move, we move from rock and rollers to cart masters. Um, and, um, and so then the cart master is a fair bit more rugged than I think that what looks like from the surface from a mag liner. So, so we just had a different, different view of that process. Uh, next question. And it's your QR code hard at work here with a Barrera from Flowery Branch, Georgia. I want to use my iPhone this weekend to film my niece's wedding with my iPhone 15 Pro Max. Is there an adapter you can recommend so I can charge, connect audio, and have my solid state drive connected while recording? Yeah, I mean, there's the the main the main thing you want to think about is also what what are you going to attach that all to? So if you're are you going to use something like a small rig? Um, uh, that's the thing to kind of think about there. Uh, are you going to, um, you know, so how are you going to attach that? Um, there's a variety of, you know, OWC makes a variety of little breakouts. Most of these USB-C hubs should work for what you're doing. Um, the main thing is, um, you know, it's the power and edit audio. We haven't, I haven't connected that. I haven't figured out which one I want to use yet. Um, so I don't, I don't have a, a strong answer for you yet. Although Nick Bat sent me a uh, Nick, if you're watching this, Nick sent me a video that I've seen and it is amazing. I'm like, put it on your site or put it on our site. <laughs> He's got to put it somewhere. He's got a great iPhone rig um, that is um, set up there. So um, we're, we're still trying to figure out which one, which, which hub we want to use. But most of those hubs should be able to take power. Um, and it's I, my concern is less about which hub to use from a performance perspective. And it's really about um, which one can I attach easily to the rig. So I have a, I have a, a small rig that I've kind of built out. Um, the, the challenge that I have with the small rig, I think that, I, you know, I got the small rig that, let's see if I can, if it's in my, I don't know if I can grab onto it right now. I got the small rig. And, oh, here it is. Um, so this is the kind of thing that I'm kind of slowly building up. But the problem is, is that it's right. It's the size of the of the camera, and I couldn't understand why Apple didn't use something like this when they built theirs. They had the bigger one that was around, the more general one. It's because you have more space on the USB C on the end when you're putting the handles together. So I may be getting the generalized one, and then potentially putting this one inside of that because I kind of like both versions of that rig. So anyway, so um, but that's the you know. So I think it's figuring out the rig there that that's um, you know that that you want to look at. But I would look at OWC probably as. Uh, where you want to start looking for those hubs. Um, next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. Uh, will Wi-Fi 7's deterministic latency help audio video apps like Dante, et cetera? Right, go ahead, John. It's not the communication protocols. The problem with Wi-Fi is the interference. So I have 22 access points that my, that my system can see from my house. And I live in a traditional neighborhood. Um, you've got so much, you got so much interference at those frequencies. That's the problem with Wi-Fi. Yeah. And, and I don't think that also, uh, I don't know how Dante would, Dante requires so little latency. Uh, so the latency to be so low, I don't know how that would work on Wi-Fi when people can't talk about it, but it's, it's pretty rough. We've run Dante over fiber over a very short period of time, you know, over dedicated, you know, uh, dark fiber over hundreds of miles, but 
it, it fell apart pretty quickly, um, you know, and you have to clock both ends and there's a lot of other things you have to make to, to make that actually work. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael is in with another question. Have any of you used third-party touchscreens on Mac OS? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Um, Wacom is uh, is a popular choice, and I don't have Cintiqs around anymore. But uh, the well, Wacom those are those are. Screen. I mean, those aren't really. I don't know if you would consider those touchscreens as much as a um, uh, you know the, the tablet. Um, as far as a touchscreen goes, m- many touchscreens will deliver the. Uh, and, and I have used. The, a couple different ones. I don't have them. I don't have the names of them, but I have used them with the Mac OS. And so basically what happens is, is that you have HDMI going out to the screen. You have a USB connection from the screen, like a keyboard back into your Mac. When you touch on the screen, it just simply goes, well, that's where that is. <laughs> like, you know, like it's like you're moving your mouse, you're, you're touching on the screen and it, and it delivers back a, um, a coordinate um, as a mouse um, device uh, or, or similar to a mouse device. And they've all worked. Like, I haven't had any of them that, that I bought. Now, I will say that when I buy them on Amazon, I look to see that it says Mac OS somewhere, like they've tested it there. So, I, But every one that I bought has worked. Um, the real thing that you're looking at is what kind of, you know, how sensitive they are to your fingers. It's less about will they work or not and, and are they going to be sensitive. So those are the, um, those are the things you want to kind of think about there. Um, next question. Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Samsung to hold Galaxy Unpacked event on Wednesday, January 17th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Will you go to the live event in San Francisco or watch the stream? And what do you expect will happen? Live event tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, hmm. be interesting to go down and see it, but I'll probably watch the stream if I watch it. Now go ahead, Courtney. I expect they're going to announce the uh, S24 flagship phone i got a question for you i got a question for you courtney this is really important do you think it'll be the best ever the best samsung phone it'll be the best samsung ever that's for sure (laughs) well i don't like it because it's got (laughs) sharp corners on it that poke into my side if i put it on my side (laughs) so for me it ain't the best ever you know i like the rounded corners but i guess apple holds the patent on rounded corners yeah yeah, exactly good uh, john Never have I seen a sticker on some kid's laptop or skateboard or car. Nobody cares about Samsung Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say, you know, I did, I, I worked on a couple of events um, for uh, Samsung. And uh, what you don't see, what's really interesting is, is in, at a Samsung event, you know, there's the keynote, right? But there is an enormous amount of influencer support and um, other support that you that comes with that Samsung uh, event. So they have the event and then off, I don't know if this event will have that, but I can tell you that other event, other Samsung events have had this. Um, we built one where we had, uh, we built this giant, I mean, and I mean, it was like 20 feet by 20 foot, uh, uh, big soft box above, above the creators or above a place for the creators. Then we had a big green screen. And I actually, this is, this is how I got an Ultimat. I had an Ultimat, um, I don't know, the 10 plus or 11 plus or whatever, right before Blackmagic bought it. Um, but it was a 444 green screen. Yeah, it was $33,000. Um, and uh, some of that was offset by this, by this event. Um, not all of it, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, so it was a real-time green screen keyer so that they could, they, basically what we set up was a record so they could look at the new phone, give their opinions, do all those other things, and we would record it keyed over whatever background. That, they had a couple different choices of backgrounds that they wanted. And it could be very organic or it could be very techy or whatever. And we built them all and synced all the cameras to them and everything else. And then they could they could uh, watch those. And it was... It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a good. It was a good. It was a. It was a fun show to, to work on. But I think that that's the thing you don't you don't see when you watch these. You you watch the live stream, but going to those events isn't. You probably think, well, why would you ever go? Because you're just going to sit in the audience. But you get in addition to touching the phone, there's oftentimes a lot of contextual stuff. Like Apple sometimes has whole. You know, if they're talking when when they did the hi fi. Um, they had, they built out whole living rooms and whole, uh, you know, the, all these things that you could walk in and kind of experience what it's like rather than just looking at it at the space. And so there's a lot more to it than just going to the stream. Yeah, go ahead, Harshit. It's going to be really interesting to also look at the AI, AI's perspective on that because uh, Bixby is supposed to be regenerated, so to speak. So the whole AI talk uh, is going to be interesting how they partner up with Microsoft and others. So yeah. we'll see. Absolutely. And, and it, you know, obviously, um, are they using LIDAR or some other way to do that? 
Are they going to, what's the resolution of the camera? You know, what kind of, what kind of recording are they going to be doing? Those are the big questions that a lot of us are going to ask because the number one thing that people choose their, their phones for is not their phone. It is their camera. <laughs> like the camera is everything. So what we can expect to see is a good camera you know, or not as good sales. Interestingly enough, by the way, the Samsung for the first time since 2010, when it overtook Nokia, uh, is not the largest uh, shipper of phones um, this quarter. It is Apple. Um, still with only 24% of the market, but Apple has uh, passed Samsung uh, for the first time in 14 years or ever. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. I know you guys are getting tired of me holding my uh, iPhone 6 up uh, and saying, I Every, still have this everybody's and I use it as a phone. So cute. You know, it's so it's so cute that you do that. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much. But, but, it's, 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 but I use it as a phone. It works about great. Upgrading. It's, you, you, might, you might enjoy it. Um, I, the reason, you know, the funny thing is I, uh, one of the big reasons that I, I give my kids and my my wife the last phones that I was using is to make sure that when they're out taking pictures, that they take pictures that are high enough quality that that we want to use them later. Um, so so making sure that they have new instead of sending them the phones back, I give them to my kids because they um, because then when they take pictures of their friends and they take go out and do their their, their thing, they um, and my that my kids have taught me a lot about how to use my phone my camera, <laughs> like 0.5, uh, so many 0.5 pictures. Um, that's, that's what you get good at. Um, next question. Gordon Lake is here from Los Angeles, California, asking, when sending proxies from the Blackmagic camera app to the cloud, then down to resolve for editing, can the proxies be used in a Zoom show or is the quality too poor? You know, here's the worst part is, is I told Gordon to ask this later because we're going to test it. I haven't gotten to test it yet. We are testing it this week, though, because one of the things we want to do Next week is, we're not sure, you know, we we put out a call for action, but so far we haven't got anybody to volunteer for being on the ground at NAM. So we'll see what we actually do there. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to test there is shooting stuff from the phone and having somebody on the other side getting it in, in the Blackmagic cloud. So I'm using this as a way to kind of figure that out. So stay tuned for us to do more, more research there, but don't know yet. Uh, next question. Danny Grizzle from Longview, Texas, asks, for very large, one terabyte, decades-long retention of catalogs, what digital asset management system should you be considering? Boinks from Mimo Live, Photo Magico supports Peak 2, which looks interesting. You know, it's a um, very large, by the way. One terabyte is n not super large. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to rain on your parade, but it's not. It, it, there's a, there's a lot of things that will handle one terabyte. Um, the biggest thing, you know, as far as I, I think Photo Magico is is a pretty um, a pretty useful one. There are uh, a variety of tools that um, you know it depends on what what do you need from your uh, digital asset management. Do you need uh, is it video? Is it is it stills? Um, is it audio? Is it all of the above? It's do you have project files? Do you have you know those are the kind of things you want to think about as you start to think about that retention. It's not just it's not just it's what are you going to save. In general, whatever you're going to do for a digital asset management system, you want to make sure that you're saving to two different physical things and one in the cloud. So two physical uh, devices um, that are geographically separated. So they're not in the same house. They're not in the same office building. So that if it burns down or something happens, you have it in two different places. And then you also want to have it somewhere in the cloud. And by the, you know, that three, two, one, three, three things, two, two physical, one in the cloud is uh, three, two, one is, is something that you want to keep on thinking about there. So um, consider, I will admit for most of my day-to-day -day photos, my, my digital asset management is photos, Apple's photos, uh, mostly because it just simply distributes it, everything to everything you know, all the time and keeps it all in the cloud and keeps the originals up there as well. Um, but um, I, uh, you know, but I think, you know, for We've worked with lots of different ones depending on what the client needed, actually. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Is it typical for these programs to have the ability to export like to XML or some type of uh, database? Usually. So you have a record of them? Yeah, usually there's, there is a, um, uh, uh, usually there's a database that, that I mean, they, you can export. That's part of like a true digital asset management system is going to be the ability to actually make that actually happen. So... Um, coming up next, we're going to talk about Illustrator and talk about our logo here and just uh, hopefully, hopefully something that's interesting to everybody else. It was enough. I, I learned enough putting it back together that I, that I decided to go ahead and show it. Um, uh, but, and tomorrow we're going to be talking about, um, the mic off. We're going to have a couple of different mics here. Um, and, uh, 
Uh, we are going to test them all against each other. And so you can decide what you think sounds best uh, compared to this mic, the mic that I'm using right now. Uh, to, Thursday, we've got John Ross. John Ross is one of the top thinkers when it comes to surround music for uh, film. And John Ross is going to be joining us from his studio and answering your questions about surround mixing. Um, on Friday, we're going to talk about understanding the black magic cloud. Um, and so we, so I, I will have more answers for the Gordon's question by Friday. Um, and then, of course, the weekend is a bit of a more of a Q&A. So uh, we have Q&A on Saturday and Sunday's a little bit more of an introspection. If you've got concerns or questions about office hours, we don't stream that day. So if you're watching this, uh, we don't stream that day, but we um, but we do talk about whatever you want to bring up uh, regarding what we're doing here at Office Hours Global. Welcome back to the second hour. And if you if you're new to this, uh, you know the one of the things to notice is that we we do we can't take your questions. So we'll, I have a I, I can see the questions coming in here. Uh, you can also go to YouTube dot uh, slash Office Hours Global. So we are now. This is the first time we're trying it. We didn't want to do it with 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 with. We wanted to make sure we this starts to work. Um, so we have. Um, uh, we're streaming to the Pixelcore channel as well as the Alex Lindsay channel. And as a result, we want to make sure that you know that we're not going to do this every day. Uh, we're going to do it occasionally, um, but you can go to YouTube. If you want to see these every day, if you want to at least know that they're happening every day, you can go to youtube.com slash office hours global. If you've got questions for the second hour, as I, as I start to talk and you're not inside of Makana and you're watching on one of those other channels, you can go to uh, askofficehours.global. Uh, That's askofficehours.global. You can use this little QR code here um, as well. So, um, so that's what we, um, you know, that's what you can, uh, that's kind of how to stay involved in this. I know that this is kind of a bit of an experiment for us um, to, uh, to make that work. All right. Now we're going to um, talk a little bit about logos. And, um, and so what I, you know, the, uh, uh, we have a, you know, we ha obviously have the office hours logo and uh, I'm going to actually jump into the uh, the first question is um, that, uh, and, and I'm going to talk about a little bit how we created it because the Office Hours logo is not particularly complicated, but you would think that you're going to approach a certain way to rebuild it. And it, I found a, what I think is a reasonably good way to do it, which I'll show, show you and hopefully it'll all work. Um, the, uh, the thing to, to see here is that what, one of the things that I, so by the way, so if you look at the Office Hours logo here, let me uh, grab... This is what I kind of started to work with. Now, there was kind of a gray and white version. Um, this is the more, oops, uh, this is the more white version. Um, so now, one of the things that I did is I started to, I needed more space in between here. I wanted these edges to be a little bit softer. And as I started to do that, I, so what I did is I blurred it and affected the, you know, just to kind of visualize this. I started to blur it and um, and tweak the contrast. Um, so you can, if I, if I open up... Uh, my, my levels here, if you start to grab onto some of these things, you can you can tighten these edges up. You can see how those edges got softer or harder um, depending on how I'm playing with that. And so a lot of times, you know, when I'm trying to figure something out, especially, especially when you're trying to figure out things like rounds, you know, it was a little easier to do it there. Um, and so this was just a, a, we pulled this from, um, here you can see this, is a, you know, kind of pulled some of this information. This is kind of the hard, the hard uh, pull from the, the, the gray logo that you've seen in the past. And I wanted to kind of soften it up a little bit and um, and play with it, and so I uh, started to kind of work through this. the The issue is that I ended up with a photo image, <laughs> and that photo image is not particularly useful because it's not reproducible. Now, one of the the first questions that Dave Troutman has, I'll go ahead and let you read it, Mitchell. Dave, I'll jump into this question real quickly. Go ahead. Sure. Dave, Dave Troutman uh, from Edmonton, Canada, wants to know the logo is not very colorful. Uh, was that a conscious decision or just expedient? No, it it um. You have to have a logo, in my opinion, you have to, I mean, this is, and there's probably better people that are more uh, uh, skilled and, and experienced than I over um, over that process. But um, I am, uh, uh, I believe that every logo has to stand on its own at a distance, at a very small size without any color or it can't, it, it's not, um, it's not usable. <laughs> like you have to have, uh, you, you have to be able to, I always think about does, will this fit on the top, on the front of a baseball cap? Like if, if I can't figure out how it's going to be on a mug, how it's going to be on a baseball cap with one color, um, and I can't visualize, oh, I would want to wear that baseball hat. Then I tend to, I have a tendency to not want to use that logo, um, or not want to work on it. So that's, 
So that's the, um, you know, so that's the first step is to make sure something is iconic enough. And if you look at most large logos, there's lots of people that have lots of logos with lots of things in them. Um, but if you look at most scalable logos, they're pretty simple. And, and the reason is they have to go on a lot of different things. Um, and as you make them more complex, you make your um, output much more, much more difficult. Um, and so, so one of the things that we kind of took into account here was making something that's relatively simple. One of the problems that I had and what I, one of the reasons I wanted to dig into this was that the, when the logo got really small, it was really hard to get, see the differences of these edges. So um, the edges um, started to close in and you couldn't see them. So I needed to make this gap a little bit bigger than what it was before. Um, but again, it was, it was a, um, a little bit of a, but that's, I mean, that's why, but we started, I started to play with that because um, I was looking at it in a very, like 16 by 16, or not 16, but 32 by 32. Like, can I still figure out what I'm looking at there? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I can confirm 100%. And if it doesn't look good in black and white, it's not going to look good in anything else. So that's a good starting point. And what's interesting, I was looking at your uh, edging where you're doing your corners. It's almost as if uh, you're invoking some type of aliasing that wouldn't otherwise be there. Oh, that's because in this case, it was because I was actually jumping to it. One where I was, it's not designed that way. And in fact, if you look at the one that I was using, kind of playing with there, uh, it should, let's see here. There we go. it, it, you can see it's softer there. When you push that contrast too hard, you end up with that aliasing. That's just pushing the black and white too hard. Um, anyway, so that's that's what that looked like. So we ended up with this. The problem is I liked I liked what I liked that as a single color. The problem that I had was that that's not usable anywhere. It's a blurred document um, that's pixely, you know, that's pixel based. I need a vector version of it. Now the temptation would be to go, oh, this is really good and now I'm gonna trace it, but but it needs to be mechanically correct. It can't just be like, well, this gear is a slightly different part, slightly different than the other gear and trying to trace that perfectly was gonna take a lot of time and probably was never gonna work out. So what I had to do is figure out a way to do it in a more um, uh, 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 mechanical way so that so that it is, it is it is exactly what it needs to be. Now I'm gonna I will say that I'm gonna do some some of the stuff and I'm gonna do this in Illustrator. Uh, I'm gonna do some of these things and they're not gonna be perfectly precise just because you're all watching and I don't want to sit there and and uh, fiddle with every pixel um, as I as I work. But I'm gonna but I am gonna kind of give you a sense of the approach to this and then and then answer your question. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this right now. So. Um, so here you have the logo. This is just set as an underlay. Um, so I have an underlay here and uh, and I have the logo in here that I wanna trace. And I'm gonna go to my layers and you can see that I have it set up as reference here. So this is just, all I did is load this in, lower the, lower the, lower the transparency and lock it. So that I have it there. Um, bisecting that are these guides and that's gonna make it easier for me to find things that I need to do. And these guides are simply just running right through the center of that, of that image. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and um, uh, and and I will one thing I'm going to admit is that you'll see me struggle a little bit with Illustrator. I have not used Illustrator for many years. I was using Affinity uh, Designer for the last I don't know four or five years. I just didn't want to pay the subscription because I wasn't using Illustrator often enough to make it worth it, and so I was I'll just use Designer. The reason I'm showing it to you in in Illustrator, which I'm not as facile with is specifically because uh, it has this rounded corner thing, which I'll show you that a uh, designer couldn't do. <laughs> so, so I was like, well, I'm gonna have to go to Illustrator. I test, you know, I downloaded it for seven days uh, as a test and then I, I tried it and it worked. So I, that's, why, that's why I'm using Illustrator, but you will see me, um, you know, struggle at times um, in, this, uh, in this process because of that. Um, and so, um, and, and you can put in suggestions here. So, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to grab the ellipse tool and I'm going to create a new layer, which I'm going to call my uh, inner gear. And uh, I'm going to take this ellipse tool, and I want to go right into the into the into these guides here. That's one one of the things I'm using these guides for here. And I'm going to I'm going to hold down the Option key and click. Oops, I'm not going to hold down the Option key. Sorry, I'm going to click here and drag. I didn't hold it. I didn't do that. It it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Hold it down and click it and hold it here. And I'm going to pull it out like this. And you can see that I'm just going to get get it so that it matches that circle there. Okay, so that's the first step for for what I'm actually putting together there. Now, that's that gets me to that first part. I'm not going to worry about the center part just yet. So what I'm going to do here is scale up to here. Now, what I'm doing to do that is holding down my shift and option key and scaling up. 
I can use the roller on my to 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 roll down a little bit. And um, and now what I'm going to do is is I'm going to grab this and go to the rectangle tool, and I'm going to hold down again my option key. And again, this isn't going to be pixel perfect, but you'll get the sense of it. Um, I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to pull it so that it it is right at the very top there, and it's kind of bisecting where those edges are. So I'm going to kind of grab grab that there like this. And I what I did is I started too high, so I'm going to undo it, and I'm going to do this a little lower again. Undo it down here. It doesn't really matter how far it goes in. It just needs to go in enough um, so that when I do the next step, it works. So, so I'm going to do this here like this. I'm going to kind of bisect those, those rounds, and I'm going to raise this up to the top here like that. Now what I'm going to do is go to select my individual points. And so I'm going to select this point and hold down my shift key and select this point. So now I've got these two points here, and I'm going to hit S for scale. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to click on where I want to start the scale, and then I'm going to open these up like this. And so I'm going to open that up like that. And you can see how I just scaled that out like this. And it's a little off as you can see, but we'll, we'll just deal with that for now. So now we have that like this. So there's that, um, there's that piece of the gear. Now I'm going to back up and um, I'm going to go up here. And what I'm going to do is just say R for rotate. And I'm going to hold down my option key and click right in the center again, right in the center here. And I'm going to click on it and it's going to bring up this interface and I can define what I want. So I'm going to say, I want to rotate it 60 degrees and I want to copy. Oops. And I, what happened there is I had those two points. So it did it for the points instead of the object. So I'm going to click away, click on it, hold down, hit, hit rotate, hold down my option key. And I'm going to click on that again. And I'm going to set that to 60. And I'm going to say, I want to copy. So I don't want to move it. I want to copy it. So you can hear now if I hit command D, 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 D. So now I just made all of the the gears all in one all in one fail swoop. Uh, I'm going to turn this layer off so I don't have make any mistakes. And I'm going to grab these, and I'm going to take this and just select all of them. Oops, select all of these here. And this is where I'm going to use the Pathfinder. And the Pathfinder is basically a boolean um, function here. So what I'm going to do here is go click. And so now that what that did is it made it one object. So that's the first step of that. Um, of that process is to is to create that inner uh, layer um, that that I have there. Now the second thing is to start building the outside gear um, that I that I have. And um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have the inner layer, and I'm going to turn that off for the moment. And I'm going to create a new layer that's called outer gear. Um, all right. So now I'm in this new layer. And what I'll do is I'm going to take the, um, this is where it gets a little, little more complicated, not, not super complicated, but I'm going to take this here. I'm going to, I'm going to hold down my option key, hold down my shift key to keep it constrained to a perfect circle and go out to the inside of those gears there. So that I have that there. And now I'm going to zoom into here and do pretty much the same thing I did before, which is that I'm going to take the rectangle and I'm going to hold my option key down and zoom out and open it up like this so that I have roughly where I want to be there. So the same thing here, I'm going to grab onto this point, hold down the shift key, grab onto this. I'm going to hit the scale tool. I'm going to click, I'm going to click here. And then I'm going to grab these and just pull them out like that. So that, so there I have that where I'm roughly matching what that looks like there. I'm going to zoom back out again. Alex, do you need the stroke on that when you do that? I don't. I, I have the stroke on because I'm going to use it later for a different one, but the stroke doesn't really matter. Uh, I will use it in a second. I do need the, the stroke for, for something I'm about to do, but I don't need it right now. Um, so now I take this. Now, interestingly enough, I don't need all of these. I only need this one. <laughs> so, for, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these two. And, um, and I'm going to make sure that I select them both um, like this, turn this off. I'm going to do this again just to make sure, that, yeah, there we go. And then I'm gonna union them like that. Now, what I am gonna do also though, is I'm gonna turn this back on. I only need to build this one section. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build another square and I'm just gonna grab an area here like this, just so I have enough of it. And um, if you look at it here, I'm going to select these two and I'm going to say, I just want where they intersect. So now I just grab that little section there. That's the only part that I need for what I'm about to do. 
So, um, so the next step that I'm going to do here is, so I've got this outer area here, but I need to build this gap along here. And again, you could try to draw it, but what I'm going to do is go down here to this path that I have, and I'm going to copy that path here, and then I'm going to move that path up to here. Um, I'm going to try to move that path up to there. Why is that not? Oh, because it's not on. I do, that. I do that fairly often. All right, so so now I have that path up here. Now that that probably now I'm going to turn this stuff off because it's going to get confusing. Um, and what I'm going to do is I have a I'm going to select this this here, and I'm going to go into color, and I'm going to go actually into that layer, and I'm going to make it red so I can see it clearly. Um, there, it doesn't really matter what color it is. I'm I'm just using it to cut something out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now take the stroke. And as I open up that stroke, you'll see it get bigger there. Now, if I turn on, um, if I if I extend it out, I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger. There we go. So there's a nice nice big layer that I've cut out of that um, that's that's there. Um, and I can take a look at whether I let's see here. I can lower that. Um, I can go into here, for instance, and say turn this back on, so I can kind of see what it is. And you can see that that it may not be enough um, in that stroke. Um, so I can go and make that stroke a little bit bigger. As I make it bigger here, you can see it kind of push up against those there. So now I've made it, um, you know, very, very close to the same gap. Let's see, at 50 points, it's about the same gap there. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can do this. I can also offset. So I can turn the stroke off and offset this output. So um, another way to, but this is one way to do it that works a lot of the time. Um, again, you can you can use the offset tool as well. So, for instance, if I take if I go and I turn this back to let's say one, doesn't really matter. Uh, let's go back to one, and I um, and I go into my object, and I go to path. I can say offset path, and here I can say instead of fifty, I know that it's half of that. So I can go. I want that to be twenty five, and I can click there. There we go. So I did the same thing there. So I hit OK. So now it's offset that path. Um, so that, that does roughly the same thing. Um, this is the one that this this top one here. There we go. So um, so now I have this outer one and this inner one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this and I'm going to I'm going to select it and select the one below it. And I'm going to say I want you to subtract that. So that what that did is it subtracted that that stroke out of this one. Now I haven't done any of the rounds yet, um, but this is so that. But I've subtracted the stroke, well, not the stroke, but it subtracted the offset. But that created an even um, gap all the way around. Doing this by hand would be pretty painful um, to actually execute there. So now what I have, if I turn this back on, uh, if I turn this one back on, you can see the beginning of these gears. Um, now what I can do here is if I select, if I select this path um, that I've created, and I can throw this one away now. Just Get that, keep it clean. Um, so I, if I select this path here and I go back to my my filled arrow, my white arrow there, you'll see that I have these little controllers here. And what these are, these are this is why I ended up in Illustrator, are these little controllers. They're kind of magical. Uh, you just grab onto one and they it just soften, it just builds that that round correctly, which is a thing. You know, like that, that is not a trivial problem to handle all of those edges and it's something that Affinity couldn't do very well. Um, and then I can do the same thing here. I can select this one. Um, and if you, if you, if I select this here and then select my inner, you'll see those little controllers again. And I can simply pull those rounds to where I want them. Um, as I go through there, again, it's not quite perfect, but, but it's pretty close. And so now I have those rounds there. Um, and as I back up again, you'll see that I now have those kind of rounded. Now I only have one of these, but we already know how to fix that. So I'll turn this off here just so it keeps it clear. I will um, hit rotate, I will select this and I will hit the R key and then I will hold down my option and click right there and say I want to do 60 with a copy and then hit do command D, command D, command D, command D. So now I have, have all of those kind of built up there um, and then I'll turn this back on and now obviously I have a center problem there so I'm going to turn these off so I don't have to deal with them. I'm going to turn this off so I don't have to uh, work on it but I'm going to select inner gear as my layer. Um, and then I'm going to go into um, my ellipse tool and I am in inner gear, but I need to turn it on. Um, oh, I can turn this off so I can see it. And um, so what I'm going to do here is again, hold down my option key, click and drag. 
So it's, it's scaling from the center. The option key means it creates the object from the center instead of from the corner. And I'm going to pull it out until it matches the edge there that's there like that. Um, and then I'm going to turn this one back on, this one below it. And I'm simply going to select both of these. So they're both selected here. Um, and I am going to say I want to cut the front out. So there we have the front cut out there. Um, so now I've selected that. And then the last thing I have to do is just do the triangle. I'm going to hold down my polygon tool. I'm going to uh, hold my option key down. And I'm going to click by holding the option key down and clicking once. I, I can decide how many sides I want. So let's say three. And I'm going to pop it in here. And now I'm going to hold down my option key and pull, hold down my shift key to constrain it um, so that it's not changing in, in, in size. Pull it out to here happens to be that it turns out if it just touches that it works out well um, and then i'm going to grab that little corner tool again and pull it in and you can see how we build it there and now what i have is if i turn this uh, if i turn this background off and i turn this on i end up with the logo and and so and and, and i guess the only reason that i wanted to throw it in here and this may be a very short show <laughs> no one asks any questions about it um is but w w the reason i thought i'd show it is that it, it it isn't the typical thing you'd think about as drawing a logo is i'm going to use bezier curves and i'm going to do a bunch of other things like that and i'm going to draw it all out it was really it's really much more of a um a set of boolean operations that actually build something that's geomet geometrically com um you know uh constrained and so uh, and and that by building it that way, um, you know it's it's accurate. You know, I mean, as far as it 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 does what it needs to do, as far as putting that together, and it would be very hard to do that with just Bezier curves. Um, and and again, the other thing that that I didn't that I noticed was it was a uh, it was something an Illustrator could do. That little rounding that you saw there may seem simple when I do it, but kind of magical <laughs> like you know like for those of us who have done rounds and and there was different ways to do that in illustrator in the past but the ability to just grab it interactively around those tools are, is a pretty pretty useful thing but that's um the reason that again whether you're doing what i did here is something that i do in 3d all the time which is that you you are you know so 3d thinking about things in a bullying sort of way as opposed to so cutting things out of other things i'm going to grab this piece i'm going to do it this way i'm going to grab that piece and do it another way those are all things that, you know, whether you're doing it in 3D or 2D, it's really useful to think about them in, in processes as opposed to um, thinking about them as I'm just going to draw it. You know, can I create something with that? And I, you know, and we haven't talked much about Illustrator or how we work on those things. And I thought that that'd be useful to um, show it. So uh, especially given it's the logo that we're um, using. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Nice demo. As somebody that uses Illustrator, I love uh, what you're doing there. And it's a lot cleaner than when I do it because I end up with a bunch of uh, shapes and sizes and right. I'm too lazy to do the differences and the boolean to, uh, to make it nice. But the question I have for you is how often does using Illustrator uh, influence the design of the logo you're doing because of the functionality? Uh Everything you do is, is – is, this is why by using the right tools is really important, is that everything you do is somewhat impacted by uh, the tool itself and how to do it. Now, that's why you kind of want to start – when you're doing logos, I would recommend not ever starting in your drawing package. So if you're doing a logo or you're doing something, always start with pencil or some kind of drawing app or, or something like that. But even a drawing app can be a little bit um, limiting. But start with something that's that is um, organic, and the reason for that. And sometimes uh, I've had f people that I've worked with that start with clay. <laughs> they start to play with things, and they do. They start with clay, or they start with pencils. They start with all kind, whatever they're most comfortable with. But you want to do something where your interface to it is the most creative possible. Um, that that you can do these things in a way that um, that you can kind of fiddle with ideas without being constrained by the tool. Um, and so you see this a lot in motion graphics. You see it a lot in in almost everything we do when it comes to these things is that the tool can't do that very well, so then you don't do it. Or it takes too long for it to do it, so then you don't do it. And so you want to try not to get constrained by that when you start. Uh, you want it to be something that is pretty wide open, and then you and then you kind of um, use it to, to fill in there. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was wondering. I, I tried to, to see what artificial intelligence would come up with uh, just to create an, uh, a logo for Office Hours Global. It came up with this very colorful one. But note the spelling. 
office hours global. 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 <laughs> I just wondered if you you had uh, used uh, Mid Journey. Uh, uh, I have Hold to on, me... uh, to come up with, to you know design ideas. Some of these are way too busy, but uh, yeah, so it's I... interesting that it used the play button in there, which is how our original. Our original logo uh, started before. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, confusing. before everyone kept on saying it's confusing. Hey, so I keep everyone, getting a little play <laughs> button and it doesn't start playing. It don't play. It don't play. And you're like, it ain't broke. It just don't work that way. And so anyway, so the, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it is a, um, uh, yeah, we turned it up. <laughs> it was turned to the side, but everyone kept on talking about the fact that it wasn't, that it was confusing. And so, um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I might use Midjourney for inspiration, but I'm 100% in designing in Illustrator because once you've designed it and you're happy with it in Illustrator, you can expand it as far as you want to. You don't have problems with uh, aliasing or uh, bit, uh, bits blurring and doing weird things. Um, and I also love, uh, because I do motion graphics, that I can bring that Illustrator file right into After Effects and it uh, resamples every every frame. So it's rock solid. Yeah, and and I and I will say that the um, uh, I oftentimes am inspired by it. So for you know, so I will um, use logos like I'll do things that I'll ask it for things and have it design a bunch of things, and then I go, oh, you know, like I really like that look. I like something about it, but then I build something else. You know, it so. My stuff with Midjourney so far has not been something anything that I've used directly. You know, I think I, I I think I even took the logo and I threw it in there to see what it would do with it. Um, let me see if I can find some of those there. We've got time. Um, let me see. Um, oh, you're looking at, and Mitch's Mitch's issue is a valid one, you know, because what you get out of Midjourney and and Copilot are uh, are Dolly are bitmaps. And right. to be able to to work as a logo well, that works in print, you got to convert them somehow to stroke based. Interesting. Interestingly enough, um, I, 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 I haven't done this. Well, what's coming is Illustrator is already asking me, which I didn't, you know, necessarily show you. Is that Illustrator is already? I mean, it didn't. It just didn't pop up. Um, is asking about. Um, uh, do you do you want to use AI to generate? Um, bit bit you know like drawings and so it's it's kind of working on that i'm just going to go back and see if i can find uh let's see um if i can find what when it does that alex does it uh maintain the layers integrity uh, i don't know i haven't tested it yet um so like this i mean so you have to understand the way i do mid journey is that i do many 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 images <laughs> like it's like you know i don't i have i have the I pay for the luxury of, um, you know, I, I pay six hundred dollars a year, five hundred fifty dollars a year for the turbo, whatever the most, the most expensive mid journey, so that I don't have to think about whether I'm using what my 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 limits are, um, and uh, and so as a result, when I get into something, I just build hundreds of images very quickly. I'll have four hundred like stacked up, and you'll see that little four hundred messages in Discord while I while I'm just churning through options. And so so I'll show you a couple. I took the gear, I took the logo itself, and just put it in, and I I don't remember what I what I said for each one of these, but it was, you know, asking it to render things that were like, um, you know, so it, it didn't follow the gear itself, but I was asking it to render, you know, I have lots of different, you know, so when I play with Midjourney to think about something or how it can be used, um, it's, it's common for me to, you know, kind of play with, um, you know, ideas. And so this is, this took, I actually dropped the logo into Midjourney and asked it to build like gears and, or build something that is like metal, I think it was probably metal and, you know, um, you can see if I just hold it down, you'll just see all the different, <laughs> all the different versions of, and it, and it also thinks, has me think about it. Like, this is kind of fun. Like, uh, let's see. There you go. I might've said manhole cover in that area, but this kind one of a car, awesome. car logo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a, you or know, cup cap. and it kind of, it kind of get a tetanus shot. <laughs> anyway, not a wet get, day. I think I think oh, I asked nice. for a medallion here. I asked for an old, you know, like so. It will, you know, play with um, lots of versions of it. None of these are particularly useful in the sense that I'm not going to use them. This is where it started. It was like, uh, okay, medieval journey. I think you've been using. <laughs> yeah, I might have said something there like that. Um, the I don't know. Let's see if I. I think this will tell you. I said a metal plate on the side of a castle wall. 
So that's oh, the, okay. and, and you so can see I loaded me. this logo into it. Yeah, so it is. Yeah, so here I can, there you go. So this is medallion on the end of a necklace to see what it would do with that. Um, you know, logo on a car hood, just to see what it would do with the logo in that sense, right? Um, logo, medallion, sometimes. And the reason that they repeat sometimes, this is like in the style of National Geographic. <laughs> so, um, and this one has Sony. It's, it's, on, the, it's on the front windshield. Sunny, right? sunny, sunny. Um, but anyway, but there, um, so anyway, those are some of the things. So I do play with, um, brainstorming in mid journey, um, to, th I'm not going to use any of those images, but they have me think about, oh, I really liked what it did there. I liked what it did there. I like what, it, where it went there. And so it gives me some things to think about, but I don't find mid journey as good at generating those things. Um, but, uh, but they are, they are, they are fun. Um, next question. Next question comes from Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. It's uh, uh, adding to what we just talked about. Hints on creating a logo with mid-journey. I would say minimalistic. So say a uh, high contrast, or say minimal, a minimalistic or simplistic logo um, or iconic logo. Those are all words that, that, that do pretty well. And, and so you want to, um, you can also say them in the style of, in the style of is a really useful thing that I use a lot in mid-journey. Um, so, uh, but you can do things like, uh, I don't know if I have any here. Um, let's see. Uh, you can do things like in the style of a, of a 1930s propaganda poster, <laughs> you know, kind of things like you can ask for some pretty complex, uh, uh, let's see if I, yeah, so this was, um, like, this is not the logo, but to give you a sense of other things you can do with mid journey. I, I was trying to see if it was just able to render text in, in 6.0. But I asked for Star Wars and I put Star Wars in, in quotes so it would know that that's a word that I want to use. Um, movie poster in the style of a 40s propaganda poster, Darth Vader, Leia, Luke. And so it started to build these, you know, kind of um, <laughs> interestingly enough, not that this one's not that different than the actual uh, poster itself. Um, but this one gets a little bit different and puts random people in there that you wouldn't know. Um so, uh, but then I also had like, then I, I think this was in the style of Ivan Durrell, which is kind of a whole different um, view of things. Another one, Star Wars movie poster, Ivan Durrell. So, I, you know, and, and again, th when you look at this, what's incredible is when you're trying to, this is becoming a mid-journey talk. I know we talked about that last week. But when you think about these these kinds of things, you, um, what's interesting is, is that you, this was all done in probably a matter of minutes. You know, like it's not, it's not that I, you know, that's the incredible thing is you want to get, get a bunch of different looks and you just kind of throw that in and you just keep repeating and, and morphing, you know, to, you know, to make that happen. But it's interesting. It used the typography from the actual logo. Yeah. Did you give it that or did it no, find that on its, its own? Just, it just found it on its own. So, yeah. And then I have, um, this is fine meme, which I, which I play with relatively often. <laughs> it's it's kind of like, it's a, it's a joke. Uh, this is this is fine um so so anyway so that was the those are some of the things you can do there um the uh so those but you're playing with with a lot of uh we send them out as memes to each other um oftentimes the, this is fine so anyway it's a whole other discussion go ahead mitchell uh, it's mid journey i don't use it that often so I apologize for a newbie question but uh does it give the ability to kern and uh, mess with the lighting on no. uh on text <laughs> it's just zero text i know capability. we've wandered off we've wandered off uh, off the off the beaten path here but no we haven't uh uh yeah no next next question Next question is coming to us from Stephen Montaigne of Madison, Wisconsin. When designing a logo, do you begin with a static logo and design a motion version or vice versa? Do you see a motion animated version of the Office Hours logo in the future? Yeah, we'd, I'd like to animate it. It probably won't it, it probably won't look exactly like that. That's going to be kind of an iconic version. I want to have one that looks a little bit more like Gears. We played with that in the past and just didn't get to quite what we what we wanted to do there. So, um, so I'm going to work on a 3D logo of it. But it'll probably be one gear over top of the other gear with kind of a glass piece in the center. Um, yeah. So uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, you could have the pyramid or upside uh, pointing a play button ticking like Tick like a clock every second, and then when it gets to sideways, it highlights it. Goes to yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of things we can do. Like the, the biggest thing is building the the logo itself in 3D and making sure that it's well formed that we can use it in a lot of places. Um, next question. Uh, next question from Craig McFarlane 
Um, not sure where that is, but uh, have you thought about what parts would animate if there was a need? Yeah. So what I want to do is have them in the, the the two gears interacting with each other, and the you know like one gear under top. So this is a very iconic view of it, but the idea is that in the three D version, it would the gear one gear is on top of the other one, and they're kind of rotating around, and then there's like a piece of glass in the center with a light, and you know, I, I, I have ideas of what it would look like. Um, we wanted it at originally we wanted to have that bottom gear be more of a platform that kind of sat down, but I. I think we we failed enough at that that <laughs> that we decided not to do that anymore. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. I, you know, as somebody that worked on it in the three D world uh, in the beginning, that was a bit of a challenge to get the stand for it. I yeah. like the concentric gears, and I really like that glass uh, coverage because it mm -hmm. could also it could also support an LCD screen behind it that could do other things if you wanted it to. So yeah. it's uh, it's kind of cool. And to ask, answer the question specifically, whenever I do motion graphics, I always start with the static image. Uh, and it's usually an EPS or Illustrator file. And then once I have the, uh, the image there in the screen, then I decide how everything flies around and gets to that spot. But that's generally how I work it. The next question. Next question from Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas, uh, referencing vector art. On one hand, it's amazing how robust and durable PostScript has been for decades. As time goes on, I'm experiencing more rasterization quirks, perhaps due to all the knockoff emulators, experience, and workarounds. Well, I mean, I think that the quirks that you see in a logo when it's being scaled up or down, I'm assuming that's what you're talking to, is usually badly formed geometry. So when people do things like try to trace that by hand, when they use auto tracing, because what auto tracing would do if it, if it grabs onto that, it's not going to do it cleanly like what I just showed you. It's going to kind of put a bunch of points everywhere. In fact, we could probably try it here just to see what we get. Um, the uh, Let's see if I go back to... I just go back. I'm going to turn this reference on. I'm going to turn these off. Uh, we'll go to this image. And I haven't done auto trace for a very long time. So we're going to see if this works or not. Um, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to select it. I think I'm going to unlock it. And then I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to go to its properties. And I'm going to its opacity back to 100%. Then I'm going to take that image. I have it selected. I'm going to go into Object, Path. Let's see here. Convert to... Is it Convert? I don't think it's Convert to Shape. Um, image Trace, Make. Let's see what it does here. Uh, did it do, do it? I don't think it did it. I don't know if I, and I haven't done this for a long time, so now I'm kind of wandering off into the, um, the image tracing isolation mode. Yeah, I don't know if it actually traced it here. Someone might be able to suggest that. I, I haven't done it, but it would trace it, but what you'll end up seeing is a whole bunch of little points along here that it's building. It's not, it's not a clean image. So there'll be a lot of extra control points and a lot of extra Bezier points because it's just kind of doing the best it can as it goes around. It's not going to, what I did is mechanically correct. Like it is, it, it, it uses no extra curves. And the reason I did that is so that if I wanted to make it a 3D logo, I want to print it, I want to do all those other things. I'm not going to have PostScript errors um, because PostScript errors generally come from a bunch of control points sitting on top of each other. Um, go ahead, uh, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I used to have this problem a lot with, uh, I used to get, uh, have to create screen graphics to appear on a screen for advertisers and they'd send me their, their art department would send me uh, illustrator images of the five different screens that are supposed to transition or animate and I'd have to convert them into bitmaps in order to do the screen animation. And uh, you bring it into Photoshop, uh, an EPS file into Photoshop and it, and you tell it to convert to a bitmap that's this size. And it'll never do it the same twice. <laughs> it's and so if you want to animate little pieces on there with one piece staying the same, you end up with that thing kind of moving a little bit, one or two pixels, either direction and size or position. It wasn't very uh, accurate at rasterizing a stroke uh, accurately, a, a stroke image accurately. So you have to tweak it constantly. Next question. 
Next question from Craig McFarlane uh, asking, can you speak to scaling and do you do simpler versions of small uses or very small favicons aren't reduced to mush? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the reasons that we did this one. This one is about as simple as we can make it in the current structure of what we have. We can make it simpler if we made even a simpler logo. But um, as far as this goes, extending the, the, so one of the things that I did do is I made the gap, I ex increased the gap here through here to be more than it was previously. And the reason specifically for that is when it scales down, you can tend to see that little as a line. Um, and so that when that scales down, you still see a little bit of a line in there. And so I felt like that was one of the, the hardest parts that I had to deal with. It was much in the older logo. In fact, the logo you probably see at the beginning of the show, um, it's a much, uh, it's, it's actually a thinner, there's a thinner edge here that I don't think worked as well, um, just because it didn't scale down as well. Um, as far as scaling up, obviously the big thing, I mean, this, so this should scale about as good as, the, uh, this is about as simple a logo as I can make it. Um, and still have it work. Um, I could probably get rid of this line altogether and make it even simpler and it might go back down to a favicon um, relatively effectively. But I think it's pretty close. Um, I have to look at it as an actual favicon, but I think it's actually got, it would at least hold some of the structure um, to it. Uh, we'd have to, I, I, I've looked at it very small. I'm not sure if I put it into a, a URL for a browser yet, um, but uh, but it, it is going to mush up a little bit and that's kind of the nature of, of that process. But yeah, you want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, next question. Ken Jordan from Surrey, United Kingdom asks, what version of Affinity Designer did you use? Version 2 offers a significantly enhanced feature set, especially for creating better rounded corners. You know, I have to test it that way, Ken, and we should we should we should do a test on that. I I didn't test it there because I don't have it. I you know it's kind of I I I didn't upgrade it because I didn't really feel like I, there was anything new. But now that I know that there's better rounded corners, I might give it a shot um, to see if it does the rounded corners better because it it had the rounded corners as well. It's just that it broke on where the if where it broke was right there. Um, so these edges just weren't they were pinched, and and I have a feeling that the reason it broke, and I think it broke here as well. I have a feeling it's because it's this is curved edge that went into this that needed to be rounded, and it just didn't it just didn't know what to do with that um, in that in that area, and so that's where I had that specific problem, um, and I I should get affinity. I, it just wasn't one of those things that because I the way I use, I have to admit that like with Illustrator, there's nothing there's other than this round tool, there's almost no tools in Illustrator that I particularly um, feel like I need except for. Uh, that, that, that they didn't have in, for, in Illustrator 6. I know I'm very old and crotchety about that, but it, it, it's just, it's been, uh, you know, I, I felt like all these tools got a lot more complicated and thinking about all these things the way that I have to think about them um, is a little bit, you know, of a process. And so, and I just don't do enough. Like if I was a designer and I was doing this every day, I don't think it'd be a problem at all. In fact, um, to do this logo, I had, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of bad words used while I created that logo because it was just me learning how to, like, why isn't this selecting and why doesn't this cut out and why isn't this working? And I don't understand why, you know, it was because I hadn't used Illustrator uh, for years. Um, and so it was, it, and I will say that Adobe has, and I think that there's a place for both designer and illustrator in the sense that illustrator really, Adobe's not trying to make everybody happy anymore. Like they're not trying to make it a beginner app. Photoshop and illustrator are not beginner apps. These are, these are for designers and it, and they're putting designer tools into it and they're not worried about how complicated they're getting. Um, and I don't know whether they do that on purpose or by accident, but they're doing that because it's a, wow, Illustrator is deep. Like when you jump into it, just the amount of things you can do to keep it from working are pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, so it's, it's, uh, so you have to really, you have to, you know, learn it. It's not something you can just kind of open up and start whacking around, around with. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, I know we started work uh, some f almost four years ago on the logo. And would you say that some of these programs, no matter whether it was Affinity or uh, an Adobe product, challenged you to do different things and different, uh, you know, variations? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I, I kind of knew the logos are, you know, I don't, I like simple logos. I like triangles. I like gears. <laughs> so it was, it was, I don't think it really challenged me that much. And I've been building something with a triangle or a gear for 25 years. So I like the work ethic of a gear and, uh, and the kind of the stability of a triangle. So I tend to use them a lot, um, in things that I do anyway. Um, if you look at the Pixel logo or the DV Garage logo or other logos that I built, they're 
they they or even the Commendo logo if you if you if you're using using that you'll see a lot of a lot of triangles. <laughs> so anyway, uh, next question. Craig McFarlane from Boston, Massachusetts. When doing logos like this, is there a process you use to find similar logos that might be a conflict? Yeah, you you cut and paste it into uh, Google's image and search. <laughs> so so anyway, that's that's how you do that. Um, and so that's that's usually. I mean, you can do it with the you, you the trademark office and other things like that. But the easiest one to typically do it in is just do a. Uh, to a search in, in Google Images. And there's always ones that are kind of like yours. Like you just kind of have to, like it's, it's hard to do something that's completely original. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's what I was going to say, Google Image Search. And then if you find some, you find the image and find out who, what company they are and check their, then you can check the trademark database uh, uh, because the, the image search on the trademark database is not very good if it existed yeah. at all. You Google is really good at it. <laughs> yeah, Google is great at it. <laughs> and the uh, tests, the, uh, yeah, the, the government's uh, trademark image search is not good. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So anyway, there you go. Hopefully that's useful for folks. I thought it might be useful to show like, the, like, so people just, it would, I, I decided today would be at least interesting to say, I know how that logo got built, you know, as, you know, as we, as we move forward with it. So hopefully uh, everybody enjoyed that. But I, I thought there was enough steps there that were kind of interesting in Illustrator to, um, to just show what those actually look like. Um, so hopefully that's useful for folks. Um, and uh, maybe we'll make that into a tutorial and everyone, everyone, when you join, I don't know what we do. When you join it, you build the logo. It's like, it's like being a craftsperson and you can, you can have to build the build the logo out we'll see um anyway uh thanks so much for everyone uh, for for joining uh, if again if you are we're not leaving this video up on the other channels so if you're watching on this channel we're gonna it'll be on the office hours global channel if you want to go back and look at it um it's not going to be on the on the main channel um if you uh, if you have questions you can ask them 24 7 so uh, if you if you're you know so ask those questions anytime um and you can just go to that logo you can go to that qr code or ask office hours global uh if you want to subscribe so that you can actually um see this every single day or go back to look at the old ones um go to youtube.com slash office hours global um and that will uh that's, that's where you can find all of that there. So hopefully uh, we see more of you. Um, we're, again, occasionally you'll see us stream onto these other channels to see if it, we just want to make sure that you know we're here. Um, you know, we these are all things that I've been connected to the audiences in PixelCore and to Alex Lindsay for many, many years. And um, I thought that, well, we, it might be useful for us to at least let you know that we're doing it and give you a sense of what we're doing here. So stay tuned. We'll put these up randomly. Um, if you don't want them to be put up randomly, um, then, then just subscribe to YouTube. Doc, uh, you subscribe at Office Hours Global on YouTube, and you'll get them all the time. Or you can even get emails every day if you go to Office Hours Global. Uh, you can hit Join and uh, put your email in there, and you'll get you'll get an email every day. It tells you what we're talking about. Um, so anyway, so thank you so much if you're on one of those channels uh, for for watching. Um, thank you to the producers here who have been asking questions and kind of pushing that conversation forward. Um, really appreciate it. We can't do this without you. It's a really short show without <laughs> without your questions. Um, thanks to the panelists. Uh, we can't do this without you either um, and really being part of this conversation. Um, and, uh, and thanks to uh, the incredible team on the back end. There's a team that basically cuts this show, but also develops all the software required to make it work, um, integrates that, um, manages what we're going to talk about every day. Um, and it's a really, really amazing thing that we have figured out how to put together together uh, since the beginning of COVID. Um, so we really appreciate everybody's contribution here. Uh, we traveled uh, 63,000 miles, and that's 102,000 kilometers, and that is 504 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. Great oh, demo. Love, love it. I don't see enough Illustrator stuff. I'm glad it was a good demo. You have no idea how many times yeah. I did that last night to make sure I could do it. So, <laughs> hours. To make sure all the buttons the, where they were supposed to be? The, uh, so many places I clicked and it wouldn't, it wouldn't union, it wouldn't do this, it wouldn't do that. And I was like, I got to get, like, I, uh, those little demos always look like, oh, he just threw it together. He just, like, threw it together. Like, it was like three hours of doing it over and over and over again, watching the football games yesterday. The football game last night, I was just watching, the game was playing and I'm sitting there just doing the same logo over, over. Oh, right. And I'd have a little note going, don't.